Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Matt Leteplo, and on behalf of OTC Markets and our co-sponsor, Murdoch Capital Partners, we're very pleased you have joined us for our next presentation from NIOCorp Developments. Before I introduce our speakers, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the questions box below the slides. Once the Q&A session has ended, don't log out. You will automatically be transferred into the NIOCorp booth where you can continue to ask questions via chat and access shareholder materials. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Jim Sims, VP for External Affairs. NIOCorp Developments trades on the OTCQX best market under the symbol NIOBF and on the TSX under the symbol NB. Welcome back, Jim. Thanks, Matt, and welcome everybody today to NIOCorp's presentation about our flagship Elk Creek Super Alloy Materials project. We will be making uh, forward-looking statements today, so here is our cautionary notes and technical disclosures. Our two presenters today will be Mark Smith, CEO and Executive Chairman of NIOCorp, and Scott Honan, who is President of Elk Creek Resources Corporation, which is our uh, operating company, and also Vice President of Business Development at NIOCorp. Mark, let's get started. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Matt. Uh, we also like to thank the OTC for this outstanding opportunity. Uh, it's very good to be back uh, on the OTC stage, and we certainly uh, appreciate the uh, support of the sponsor, Murdoch Capital, as well. Um, before I get started, uh, let me uh, offer our best wishes uh, for everyone as they're trying to deal with the COVID-19 global pandemic. I'm very happy to report that everyone in the Niacort family is doing well and is staying very healthy. So uh, we're very happy for that. Let's go to the first slide, Jim. Um, a couple of, of interesting points on the slide that, that I think uh, are, are due some attention. First is the market cap, or a little over 138 million U.S. Uh, as of today, actually. And uh, our, our corporate headquarters are located in Centennial, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver, Colorado. And it is an absolutely gorgeous day here today. In terms of describing NIOCorp, um, I would say that we are a mining project development company with our primary project being the Elk Creek Super Alloy Materials Project, which is located in Nebraska in the United States of America. This project has an NI43-101 defined resource. It has demonstrated metallurgy. It has a full feasibility study with a projected robust economic plan. And a very large portion of our eventual offtake is already in enforceable contracts. We have successfully de-risked the Elk Creek project as well as I have certainly seen in my almost 40-year career and when you couple all of these de-risking factors with the outstanding people that, that really are what make up NIOCorp, I think we're truly ready for success in the very near future here. Moving to the next slide, a couple of very important points at the top of that slide. One is that this will be a large underground hard rock deposit. Um, and we will be producing three elements out of this mine. One is niobium one is scandium, and one is titanium. The probable mineral reserves are, uh, uh, through our NI43101 study, have been shown to be at about a 0.81% grade, and that does make it the highest grade niobium deposit that is currently under development in the United States. We have a little bit of scandium within that ore deposit as well, and as a result of the great metallurgical work that our technical team has done, they figured out how to produce scandium as well. And as a result of that scandium flowing with the niobium and through our process, our metallurgical process will be in the uh, position of producing approximately 100 tons of scandium per year, which will make us uh, the largest scandium producer in the world. We do have a feasibility study with a very potential, a very, very good, attractive potential economic returns. Um, we are located completely on private land, and we use the term uh, in this slide with nearby infrastructure. I would be uh, more inclined to call it immediately adjacent 
uh, infrastructure, including roads, rail, water, and utilities. Um, I can also say in my almost 40-year career that I have never had the pleasure of having this level of community, state, and local government support for a project, and it is a very welcome change compared to some I've worked on. All of the key federal state permits, uh, federal and state permits have been secured to allow the start of construction. Scott will get into that a little bit more. So let's talk next uh, about some of the things that make the Elk Creek project so unique. Uh, first of all, the three elements that we, that we will be producing, niobium, scandium, and titanium, have all three been designated as critical minerals by the United States government. We have a mine plan that shows or demonstrates a 36-year mine life. That is also very unique, and we're happy to report that we actually have ore grades that are open to the northwest, the southeast, and at depth. So this could even be longer if we do more drilling. Much of our planned production has been pre-sold. 75% of our ferro-niobium is under uh, firm, enforceable contracts. 25% is currently under a letter of intent, and we're working to finalize that into an enforceable contract as well. And we're also happy to report that 12% of our scandium, or about 12 tons per year, is also under a, a firm sales contract. And it's interesting to note that uh, although 12% sounds low, uh, that 12% or 12 tons is actually almost what's produced in the world every year today. So this is a very significant uh, scandium sales contract. We have the pleasure of having a, a very experienced uh, NioCorp board and management team. Um, you know, I guess some people might say that having over 100 years of or hundreds of years of, of experience uh, might suggest that we're old but we would much prefer to think that we're experienced rather than old. And the last point on this slide, which is something that I can say for both Scott and I, we're extremely proud of because this is just our nature, is the sustainability focus that we apply to this project. We have designed it to utilize material recycling, water conservation, and other sustainability strategies, but it basically shows Scott's and my very, very deep passion and commitment to just the basic ESG principles, which I'll cover in a moment, and just the, the, the personal values of truth, honesty, and integrity. As I mentioned, we have a, a full feasibility study that's been published and it is available on our website. Uh, we put together a little bubble chart here of some of the highlights. Let me cover uh, some of those that I think are, are uh, particularly relevant. First of all, in the upper left-hand corner, we have a pre-tax NPV of $2.56 billion on this project. That also turns into a 27.3% pre-tax IRR, both very respectable numbers. And then if you take a look at the top right-hand side, you'll notice that the average EBITDA over the life of the mine is $370 million per year. Um, those are very impressive on their own, but uh, what caught my attention when the uh, economic model was first published was the lower left-hand bubble, which talks about the average EBITDA margin over the life of the mine, and that's uh, 67%. That number is very comparable to the high-tech industry and something that, that caught my attention and certainly uh, made me even more proud and more passionate about undertaking this effort uh, to get this project into production. Moving on to the, the next slide, let's talk about some recent trends uh, that we're seeing uh, kind of uh, nationally as well as internationally. First point would be the increasing ferro-niobium consumption. You can see the chart to the right. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, there was a 67% growth in the demand for niobium. This, this was probably largely due to the volatile pricing and very high pricing of ferro-vanadium during this time frame, in which case ferro-niobium was actually substituted for ferro-niobium. But we understand from a lot of the industry uh, users of uh, ferro-niobium and ferro-vanadium that once that conversion occurs, that uh, uh, oftentimes that, that stays the way it is. So we do expect this level of demand uh, to continue to be seen and, and to possibly grow even further from this level. 
in terms of uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, initiatives around the world, we're seeing uh, major infrastructure initiatives underway in at least 13 different nations right now. There is a $1.5 trillion U.S. infrastructure bill that's on the U.S. House floor that's being debated as we speak right now. The Trump administration will have another version, and hopefully U.S. elected officials will find common ground for a very aggressive program to rebuild U.S. roads, bridges, airports, communication systems, etc. These initiatives around the world should spark a very nice boom in demand for super alloy projects, uh, particularly niobium. We're also seeing very serious efforts by both governments and the private sector to restructure critical mineral supply chains so that they are less dependent on a small handful of nations, such as China and Russia. And indeed, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just this morning that talked about that issue relative to rare earths in the United States versus China. That has certainly helped to attract more interest in companies that are developing critical mineral projects in the United States, just like NioCorp. Efforts to lightweight transportation systems, such as cars, trucks, buses, rail systems, and aircraft continue to intensify around the world, primarily driven by emission reduction efforts. To the transition to a lighter weight transportation system will also spark a boom in demand for lightweighting alloys made with niobium and scandium. Finally, I would note that many large financial institutions and investment funds, particularly in Europe, are requiring that companies in which they invest follow environmental, social, and governments, or ESG, principles. These principles are fundamental to NIOCORP's core values, and our team has a demonstrated history of reducing environmental and other impacts in the projects we develop. We believe in it. We also believe that building a corporate ESG culture can not only be good for the environment, but good for our business as well. With that, let me turn the presentation over to Scott. Scott? Thanks, Mark. The critical minerals that the Elk Creek Project will produce have a number of important applications. Niobium is used in the steel of large infrastructure projects, pipelines, and automobiles, as well as in a number of high-tech applications. It provides increased strength and corrosion resistance even when used in very small amounts. Adding scandium to aluminum alloys provides similar benefits, in addition to improving the weldability of the final alloy. These benefits, particularly in aerospace, shipbuilding, and automotive sectors, are waiting to be realized once a stable and substantial supply of scandium is available. Titanium is a, comp a common component of the pigments in paper, paints, and plastics, and as a metal, has important applications in areas such as defense, medical devices, and water purification. At present, the United States does not have a domestic supply of niobium and scandium and imports the vast majority of its domestic titanium needs. One of the focus areas of NIOCORP's project execution team has been to obtain the critical permits needed for the project in parallel with the ongoing efforts to obtain project financing. Early on, the focus was on the federal permits needed as those permits typically take the longest time to obtain. By designing the project with environmental protection in mind, we have been able to obtain all of the major federal permits. I received an early present on Christmas Eve last year as the Johnson County Commissioners voted to approve the special use permit for the project. This is the major land use uh, authorization needed to advance uh, to any kind of construction activities at the project site. And most recently on June 2nd, we received the construction air permit from the state of Nebraska after 11 months of hard work. Having these permits in hand puts us in an excellent position to start the execution phase of the project as soon as project financing becomes available. The balance of the project's permit needs have been integrated into the overall project execution schedule. If you're gonna build a world-class project, you definitely need to have a world-class team, and that's what we have in our development partners for the Elk Creek Project. These firms cover a wide range of capabilities, from labs and specialist engineering firms to commodities experts and construction companies. I particularly want to highlight Zachary and Cementation, our two prime EPC contractors for the surface and underground scopes, respectively. 
these are very capable firms with lots of big project experience under their belts. Just as important though, these firms share our vision and values, and they want to not only get us through the construction phase in a safe, reliable, efficient, and cost-effective manner, but they want to be our long-term partners in the success of the Elk Creek Project. One of the strengths of the Elk Creek Project, and one of the things that really sets us apart from our competition, are our mineral resource and the accompanying mineral reserve. The aerial photo that you see in the center of this figure illustrates the boundary of the carbonatite in black. And the carbonatite is the geologic formation that hosts the Elk Creek deposit. The carbonatite has not been fully explored to this point, and it is about 7,800 acres in size when projected to the surface. Within that 7,800 acre area, the Elk Creek operation has been designed to initially occupy about 400 acres of the 640-acre section shown in the red square. Within that red square, we have identified 287 million tons of mineral resources in the area denoted by the green shape. And that's, that green shape is only about 60 acres in size, again, projected to surface. Finally, within that green shape, we've designed an underground mine with a 36-year operating life. When we examine the exploration results to date, it's clear that the no mineralization extends to the northwest, to the southeast, and to depth, as Mark observed earlier. And as I said before, I can't wait to get underground to continue the exploration of this fantastic deposit. This graph shows the revenue and cash flow for the project over its 36-year operating life. And you note that the x-axis here starts in year four, which is really the first full production year after the construction phase. We have a good balance of revenue between our main niobium product and the scandium coal product here. In addition, we have deliberately designed a mine plan that maximizes operating cash flow in the first five years of operation. This not only gives a boost to the economics of the project, but it also demonstrates our ability to service any debt component of the project's ultimate financing package. As with our resource, Another thing that sets our project apart is the environmental benefits that come with what the project will produce. Now, Uvium has an established track record in auto manufacturing and infrastructure projects for delivering solutions that are both strong and light. And that, in, in turn, reduces the carbon footprint of the end product. Scandium has the potential to revolutionize the narrow body jet, making the manufacture of that jet cheaper and quicker and making the jet itself much lighter, which again reduces the emissions footprint. This aerospace technology has been developed and is ready to deploy. Reliable, efficient, and economical solid oxide fuel cells are only possible through the use of scandium at present. So there's a definite need for additional supplies of niobium and a reliable supply of scandium to enable these applications and realize the full environmental benefit that these two elements can deliver. At the end of the day, I think we have a strong case uh, to be made here for the Elk Creek project. We have a large resource in friendly jurisdiction adjacent to all of the infrastructure you would need for developing a project of this type. We have a balanced mix of products coming out of the operation uh, that have stable pricing and which have good prospects for market growth. Our management team is experienced, ethical, and committed to this project. Along with that, we have a strong group of execution partners that are ready to deploy uh, as soon as we get financing lined up. Finally, we've got substantial and enforceable long-term offtake agreements in place. I don't think there's many projects in the mining space that can check all these boxes and provide this level of de-risking uh, as we've demonstrated here. We're really looking forward to securing financing and getting this one built. Thanks, Scott, and, and thanks, Mark. Let's move to the questions and answer section of today's broadcast. Um, we'll take the first question that came in from Jeroy, uh, who asks, do you know where the red shovel is right now? I'll Mark? take that one, Jim. Um, <laughs> I know exactly where the red shovel is because I uh, keep it under my personal care at all times. And it's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a cute little uh, red shovel that our, our very dear friends from Belgium gave us 
uh, and, and suggested that we use it when we start construction on the project. So this has been in my personal care uh, for some time now, and I can promise you that on the day that we uh, start construction, that shovel will be on site and I will use it. So I look forward uh, to that day, but it is under my personal care and uh, it will be taken care of uh, as a very valuable piece of Diocor property. I think the plan for that groundbreaking mark is also to have Scott and his team with a little bit of a larger shovel, a Much larger. kind of a D9 cab <laughs> shovel. All right, let's go to the next question. This comes from Victor. Uh, Victor asks, can we have an update on financing? Yeah, I'll take that one as well, Jim. Um, first of all, let me say that COVID-19 has, has certainly not helped the situation. Uh, the restrictions on travel, the uh, uh, having to stay at home has really slowed things down, bottom line. Uh, but I am happy to report that things are on the move again, and uh, we're expecting um, things to develop further now as we, as we open up the world and, and allow business to occur again. So I apologize I can't give any more of an update on that, but I, I think the two messages are, uh, one, it was slowed down most definitely by COVID-19, and number two, uh, things are being worked on that front again, and we expect uh, some movement here soon. All right, our next question comes from George, who asks, has the U.S. government shown any interest in helping the project? I'll answer that one. Um, I, I think that the answer is yes, indirectly. Um, and, and what I mean by that is the, the United States government has clearly identified some minerals that they think are very critical uh, to the United States and its defense. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate uh, in the fact that all three of the minerals that we will be producing, niobium, scandium, and titanium, have been identified as critical. So that clearly helps us. I think the United States government also recognizes the need to create supply chains uh, that are safer and, and more reliable and, and won't be used as political toys. And that will also help our project significantly. Uh, we're continuing to talk to the United States government literally every day to different parts of the administration and give them information about the project and, and what our, uh, our future looks like. And they remain very interested in what we're doing. But in terms of any direct support, in terms of any financial support, uh, I can't su suggest that there's any of that support out there right now, but we certainly are getting a lot of attention. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, our next question comes from Jeffrey, who asks, what takes four years from construction to production? Sure, and that's a good question. And, and if, if you have time, I'd encourage uh, you to take a look at our feasibility study, Appendix C, uh, not many people get that far into the feasibility study, but there's about eight pages there that uh, detail uh, to a to a large uh, in a lot of sort in a lot of detail uh, all the steps needed and their interrelation as far as um, uh, how the project is built. Uh, you know, just to break it down in uh, in simple terms, there's kind of uh, I would say four big phases. The first phase uh, is really focused on uh, acquiring the land um, and completing uh, some of the detailed engineering and early procurement that we need. That's followed by about a two-year period where we're just building things. We're pouring concrete, erecting steel, installing equipment. Um, at the end of that, we get to a point that we, uh, we call mechanically complete. All of the equipment is there and it's ready to go. And then we move from there into a commissioning phase where we turn all the equipment on and, and make sure uh, it's running properly. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've seen a pump installed and when you turn it on, it spins backwards and that's not very effective. So we make sure everything's turning in the right direction, everything works. And then uh, following commissioning, we have about a six month uh, ramp up period. Uh, so we start operating the plant and because we have a large and complex project, on day one, we're not processing uh, the full quantity, the nameplate capacity of, of that plant. So it takes about six months to ramp up. We ramp up gradually in a very controlled and organized fashion. And at the end of that, uh, we have a, a plant that's running at full capacity. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Uh, our next question comes from Douglas, who asks, does a 25% offtake for niobium mean 25% of the tons specified in the FS? 
if more niobium is produced than what is in the FS, can the excess uh, be sold above the offtake, perhaps on the spot market? Yeah, I'll take that one, Jim. The, the way the contracts are, are written is that it allows for a percentage of the production, um, regardless of what that number is, but it also limits them on the upside uh, in terms of 25% of the nameplate capacity. So if we do produce more uh, than that nameplate capacity, which I have uh, every expectation that Scott will do, uh, we will be in a good position to have extra niobium, extra scandium, extra titanium to sell. So we've tried to uh, make sure that our, our customer is taken care of and they get a certain percentage of our production, uh, but it's only up to date plate capacity, and then we would have additional material to sell. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next question comes from John, who asks, what is the naturally occurring radioactive materials situation at your site? Uh, thanks for the question, John. You know, uh, as with many uh, mineral deposits, there are low levels of naturally occurring uranium and thorium, uh, same as you would find in, in your backyard, um, present in the resource. And uh, we recognize this, and, and we plan for it. Um, the, you know, the situation is one where we recognize that there's some permitting to be done. Uh, there's a permit that we need from the state of Nebraska, and we've been meeting with the state of Nebraska on this issue since uh, 2014. I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a it, it, people want to re be reassured that this isn't uh, some kind of health issue, and I, I just want to reassure everyone on the call that uh, I've worked at, at facilities that uh, have handled and managed these kind of materials uh, for most of my career. Um, there, there really is no no health risk here for our employees or the people surrounding the operation, but it's something we do take very seriously. Uh, we're going to manage it properly, uh, and we're going to abide by the state of Nebraska's requirements in this regard. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Uh, our next question comes from Alan, who asks, after financing, is the plan to move to another, perhaps larger, exchange? Um, I'll take that one, Jim. First of all, let me say that um, we are very happy on the OTC, and they have treated us uh, with respect, and they give us the exposure uh, that we've been looking for for this stage in our in our life as Niocorp. The TSX, TSX has also been at a, an outstanding exchange for us to, to do business on. So we, we have absolutely no problems at all with where we are right now. I think, however, after we secure financing and build the project and, and start producing uh, and, and start to demonstrate our performance as has been outlined in the economic models and the feasibility study, I think it would be only natural for us to consider moving to a larger exchange. Uh, and that just has everything to do with your exposure to uh, the financing world, your exposure to liquidity, uh, and if we can do anything in those categories to, to increase um, our capabilities as a company, we would, of course, always consider that. But let me reiterate how happy we are with the OTC and the TSX. Thanks, Mark. Our next question comes from Robert, who asks, other than financing, are there any other major hurdles that need to be addressed before groundbreaking can take place? Scott, why don't you start with that, and then I'll finish the answer to that question. Sure. You know, I, I don't see um, I don't see a whole bunch of, of major hurdles at this point because of all the de-risking we've done. I mean, we've taken care of the permitting. We've got uh, an advanced design. We've done the test work. We have a, a, a viable mine plan. I feel very good about our, our prospects in terms of, of getting this project started. Um, is it a big and complex undertaking? Yes, and 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 uh, that that needs to be recognized. But I think this project is in very good shape. Yeah, and I, I, I knew that's what Scott would say, and that's why I wanted him to start. And then let me finish by saying that um, I, it is very, very clear to everyone at NIOCorp that the last remaining box to be checked is financing. And we are on this, and we are taking it extremely seriously, um, so seriously that I can share a little bit of, of information with everyone. Uh, a lot of people on this call, a lot of our shareholders have met my wife, Kim, 
And uh, she reminds me every day when I leave the door to go get in the car and drive to work that there is only one box left to check. So the pressure is on. We get it. We understand it. We're on this thing, and uh, we are going to work our tails off to make sure that, that this financing uh, comes to fruition, if at all possible. So uh, we're on it. Thanks, Mark. Um, and that uh, concludes the time that we have today. Um, let me just say, for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, uh, we will get back to you, um, or you can stay on and go into our booth following the broadcast. We'll try to get to your questions that way. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great and safe day.